if you wonder if you can, if you're going to a party or a you can't go to the party anymore, right? All right. So you get invited to a party and you want to send something nice. Pardon me. Think about a set of four or six napkin rings. That is 100% shop waste. They don't have to be about an inch and a half on the outside. Um, and you, you chuck up a piece, you bore the center just for about two rings. Then you finish the center. You, you, bring, you, you bring your soft touch up, slice it off, do the next one. Then you reverse chuck them or you slide them on a mandrel and turn the outside. Very simple, but how do you say this? It's a simple but clock complex project. But once you do a set, you're going to go, how did I miss this? Uh, and if you can take pieces like Dick just showed you where you, you laminate or um, group block mix. Say you got 10 pieces out there in the shop. And they're 10 different colors. Plant them all out and glue them into one big block. And then when you cut them out, you're going to have six or eight different colors on the outside. You tend to freak them out. They will never know how you did it. Ten, ten. Then you tell them where the tree was growing. Uh-huh. That's what we do. Anybody else tonight? Well, we're on track. I want to ask you one more time. Anybody else tonight? And yes, uh, they had uh, uh, somebody put in the comments. Um, they'd asked for the formulas to the two juices, and Kim Tippin put that in there. And then somebody else who wasn't from Tennessee, I believe. Yeah, Bruce, Tennessee is asking, I have 30 pens for my fellow servicemen. How do I get them to you? Send them to me. The address is on our, on our YouTube or our newsletter or – Email me and I'll send you my address, but it's simple. It's 330 Highway Drive, Jefferson, Louisiana, 70121. And you don't have to put it in a boat to get it here. And it's not raining that much down here. So, but um, if you want to get a pen to us, send it to me. We pack them up, uh, do the IDs on them and all that, and then we get them to Doug when we get a good bundle together. Or if that's all we get in a month, we'll send them all we get in a month. But uh, here's my challenge. Make it a challenge for me. I got to put this together and send it to Doug, Doug and then make it a challenge for Doug. And he'll, mm -hmm. he will take care of the whole thing. Right, Doug? You got it. You got yeah. it. I'm all over it. You send them, I'll deliver them. All right. Anybody else tonight? Yeah, I got a couple of things, Eddie. The, all right. Uh, Is that Gary? No, it's Johnny Hughes. Oh, Johnny Hughes. Johnny, I got to find Yeah. Okay. Uh, say it again, Johnny. Yeah. Okay. There you there go. You go. All right. This is, I do a lot of, uh, spindles and table legs for a couple of furniture makers and cabinet makers around here. And this was just something I did that they wanted some angle table legs. I don't know if you can see it, but it sits at an angle there. Uh, I, I do a lot of stuff out of pine first to see how it's going to go. And that's what this was. So. Uh, and the other thing I had was a fella called me from out of Whoa, we lost you, Johnny. Hold on. Make it coming back. Uh, if your system's ringing on a hold, you lost your video. Uh, can't get you up, but we'll hang, we'll hang on one more second. Um, the beauty and the bane of this uh, can be sometimes, I, I've, I've lost Johnny. Um, let me see, I'm trying to get you back. I got you now, go ahead. Okay, yeah, this was, uh, had a fellow call me from up near Wiggins, does antique furniture, and want to know if I could do a corner spindle. And basically, I tried this just as an example to see how it went, and that's where you cut it out where it will fit onto a corner. Uh, much like where it'll fit on just like so, onto a corner piece of furniture. And so after trying it, he brought down the antique piece, 
put it there, and then I made the the one to match it there. So, oh, and nice. it's the same, same thing with the corner cut out. So. No, really that's cool what Turner would have said he cut the corner before he turned it. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, uh, actually, I, I cut the corner afterwards there. Yeah. And very carefully on a uh, router table. But the key to it is you leave the end square so that when you run it across the router table, it'll be squared up. So. Because I wouldn't try to run it across a router table round. Oh, yeah. So so you you use the square stock to start. You turn yeah. your spindle in between. You leave a tab on each end for balance or for alignment. And when you pass it through, because I'm I'm sitting there looking at it thinking I'm gonna have to build a sled jig to go on my table saw. But um, the way you're doing is going to have less impact and uh, be a little more precise. I like that idea. Yeah, it gives you a uh, a good square corner, and basically that's all I do. I draw the when I draw my lines on the end to mark the center. I also drew one down the side so I know how far to go on the router table. Okay, great. But that's that's just a way to hold them there. And there's the egg you were talking about. I went back and returned it, put it back on the lathe, and returned it. You had a little. A little slight offset, which yeah, <laughs> only because it moved. Put it back on with jam chug and redid it, but that's what it is. It's no. it's a piece of it. It's a, and he did a little stand for it because what's good to make him if you can't show them off, and uh, yeah, it was, it was there. You go. Stand, so. That is a great looking little piece. Yeah. And, and the beauty of that egg is it's thick enough to do embellishing. You can make them thin enough to do uh, penetration uh, on them to decorate them. But you can put them with completely together and with a uh, power graph tool, do the archy one on them, and they make awesome gifts. Uh, the warning. If you have grandkids, you have to make one for every grandkid. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. Every week, so. And you don't show anybody until you get them all done. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Johnny. Hi. Hey, can I jump back in? Patty? Hey, what you got? I was going to tell everybody, we went and visited Johnny this week. When you walk into Johnny's shop, this is exactly what you see. His, his shop is immaculate. I, I've never seen a shop this clean, and there's no dust around. There's no dust on the shelves. There's no dust on the stored pieces of wood or nothing. I don't know how he keeps his shop that, that clean for a man that's constantly turning, but I, but I take my hat off to you because you have one heck of a clean shop. Well, thank you got a good dust collector, Ronnie. And he uses yeah. it. Yeah. Hey, That's Johnny. It. Yeah. How about next week? Will you tell everybody how you get your Wi-Fi to the uh, shop? I'm sure a bunch of people will be interested in this. Sure, I'd be glad to. I did a little shopping on that, Johnny, uh, Ronnie, and I like it. I do like it. I'm going to use it instead of running that cable all the way out to my shop, which wasn't going to be an easy task. So, all right, Johnny Hughes, he's one of our co-hosts, folks, and a uh, contributor to the program. And you can be too. Remember, we're not locked up. We're not a club. We're not a set. It's a club, your wood turning club. And that's why I keep saying, what do you got? What do you want to show? It's, Eddie, uh, can I Eddie. dive in? Oh, who's there? It's Martin. I got to do this. I'm told. Martin I'm again. Lose. If you say again. It's Martin again, Eddie. Martin, okay, it didn't click over to you. I thought it would. So there we go. There we go. Um, I'm terrible with names, but the gentleman we've just looked at there, he had a little spindle that was, he'd, he'd been doing the two square ends. Yes. Um, can't remember his name. We've just Johnny Hughes. Johnny, we've just flicked off him. 
Um, another thing with these groups, and I always say this, if, if anybody gets themselves involved in these groups, they can learn tiny little bits of information from all sorts of people or take inspiration from all sorts of people. And he has just shown a tiny little spindle there of part of a leg, which to a lot of people will have probably just been a tiny little bit of spindle that's been cut off and it, it means absolutely nothing. To me instantly when I've looked at that, it's given me inspiration because it is exactly a ring holder. So if a base was turned and that was inserted onto the top, it would create a small ring holder so that you could put your jewelry rings onto the holder on the top. So what was nothing has now given me inspiration. That's what it's all about. That's what it's about. Taking, taking something that is turned so simply and adding a base to it, Johnny, um, it, it would create a, a beautiful effect with that. You know when you sometimes see them in jewellery shops? I don't know what you get in the States, but in our jewellery shops, we've got jewellery areas and they have little tiny spikes like what you've just shown us where the rings are fitted onto them. Normally, they are um, some type of velour or um, something like that when they're coated. But as a wooden item, they would look lovely and for a dressing table or, or anything like that. So you do get inspiration from tiny little bits of wood. You do. And remember, we don't work with junk wood. Why? Why don't we don't work with junk wood? Because there's no junk wood. <laughs> really? I mean, I had scrap iron and stuff when I got ill and, and had to be away for a while and uh, had some folks clean up my shop. They took the buckets of what they thought was scrap iron. Those were coring devices uh -huh. and bowl slicing pieces. I've been building for six months um, because it took a while to look at some of the other ones and say, this can be a shop built tool and you can do these. And I did a couple of videos on it, how you take the cores out. Uh, it wasn't as strong as some of the big brand names but sometimes you can't afford the four or five hundred dollar one. And if you could get the right materials, you can build it for thirty, forty dollars. I don't think I had forty dollars invested in the whole bucket. And and I made some snake hollerers, uh, with the offset arm hollerer that do that. I made, I made twenty five one day for club members. They came to the shop, uh, we drilled them, uh, tapped them, <clears throat> made the bases, got them fit. All they had to do is measure from the center to pin in a lake bed and we made them custom for them. It was selling for two or three hundred dollars at the time. I was charging twenty one dollars for the material. I could have made out like a bandit. All right. Anybody else got anything tonight? I got something, Eddie. Uh, Joaquin. Hold on, hold on. Say yeah. a second. I'll Joaquin you. over here. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha now. How many of y'all heard or watched Greg Dragel do the poplets? Have you seen his demo on making poplets? No. Well, this is a poplet that he does. Whoa. That's uh, less than a 16th inch on that poplet there. And then he does uh, put the stem, what is that, about an eighth? He puts it in the, uh, gets it wet, puts it in the microwave, and then does a bend to it. So I bought this from him after seeing his demo because I had to do this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is my practice piece. And when you start on it, you you put your light, after you get the hollow done, you put your light in here, you turn the outside according to the color. To sit, you know, as it you find this color here, it's that thin, you keep on going, it's gonna stay that thin as the light protrudes through this. So I said, okay, that's good. So I turned another one trying to copy him. And I didn't, this is a piece of mesquite. And I kind of made this stem a little too thick. It didn't, I didn't get the bend in it that I wanted there. So I said, well, I got to do this again. Uh, I don't remember what kind of wood this was. And so I put it on there and uh, it's probably right at a 16th, maybe a little thinner. 
and I put it in the microwave and did the bend. I got impatient with the thing. I didn't get the bend. It broke right here. And oops, there it goes again. So anyway, it was just barely hanging on anyway. But uh, this is a great little challenge here for thinness by using your light shining in here and turn it according to the light transparency. And then turning exactly enough to cut that spindle on slicing cuts. Yeah. Because you have to cut so, that, that neck or that spindle on slicing cuts. Yes, sir. Are we uh, turning them what? Like, like doing a finial, you know, when you get down to here. Yeah. And he's on Facebook. You're going to look him up and check out his stuff. He does beautiful work. Why don't you throw his name up on our chat list so these folks say they want to work. Okay. He's taught some classes up there in Ron Campbell's uh, Hands-On in Michigan. Okay. Yeah, which was canceled this year as well as anything else. Yeah, it's, it's getting us all. Okay. Well, I turned wet. Yes, it is green. I failed to mention that. You want to turn it green. Yeah. And you want to do the bend in it while it's still green. And he just soaks this wet puts it in the microwave for a little while and starts bending it. Or he laid a, shows laying a, uh, like a Coke bottle or something on it to get that bend. Uh, but he's got some YouTubes out there as well. Fantastic exercise for thin turning. Good, and, and, and it really is a good skill builder between the, the using a light to, to measure the thickness of an outside. You can move that to a bowl or a vase or another piece. Mm -hmm. uh, once you learn how it works and you're dealing with a small piece of wood, that's one technique. And then you've taken the outside and turned it into that little fine, fine line of a piece. That's another technique. And then when you, and you're doing all this wet, and then when you cut it off and heat it up in a microwave, and by the way, um, if you can afford to get your own microwave, or earplugs. Um, I need I need earplugs. I, I won't do that again. It didn't mess up anything, but I got caught. Um, but that's three skills you can build with that one technique. Now, that little thin piece that goes on in there holding it up, I learned how to cut that from Ellie Abacero. And he I think he was gonna be at AAW this year in, in SWAT also, because he comes over from the, the, the east. Uh, with the Far East, and he was going to teach there, but he does some excellent work with skews. Now, when you go to a show like him and, and, and Cindy Droza and it's coming to the other ones, they have tool techniques that you need to see. Don't worry about what they turn. You don't need to make that vase. You don't need to make that box with a point. You don't need to make anything. None of those you need to make. Stop looking at the piece he's turning and watch how he turns it. And that's why I like some of these videos. I love Kim's because she's got an overhead look, which you'd be have, and she's showing you the slices she's making and the cuts she's making. Uh, hey, Kim, if you're still around, color the inside of your gouge with a marks lot so we can, when the light gets right, we can still see where that piece is moving at. I saw it on somebody's demo the other day. Yeah, I thought about doing that. Pardon? What's that, Cam? I thought about doing that because I, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. All right, we're back. Okay. I thought about doing that because when um, I first started using my bowl gouge, I kept getting catches and I uh -oh. joined a local club, which since closed, um, and he said, take a red marker and draw down the center of my bowl gouge and he says as soon as a catch so it was it's very cool uh, to visualize how it's being being used and and so yeah I will uh, I'll try to do that but yeah, that's nice job I I saw that on this demo and then a day or two later I saw somebody using a carbide tool which can be your blessing or your bane in this business uh, in our world, uh, but he was going in with it flat on the tool rest, and it cut a lot of wood, but he stopped the lathe too early because I could see what it did to the wood. 
Now, some guys will do it, then they'll stop the late after they stand it out, they plane it out or whatever. But that was the first one. When he went over to another piece, he rolled that cutter up on an angle. I call it a bias mm -hmm. cut. Uh, he rolled it up on an angle and did some slicing. And because he had a mark on the side of that tool, you could actually tell what he was doing and where it was moving. And it was telling him what it was doing and where it was moving. Because sometimes yeah. the highest fix stayed on the work and not on tools. And I learned that a long time yeah. ago with inside Halloween rigs and stuff. Mark, do a reference mark. So you have an idea if you twist it over. Remember, I came back from using the old Elsworth straight bar with a router bit in. Um, you get an idea of where that, that tip is angled. So you know you don't, you don't want to go positive. That's a catch. You can't go too much negative because you wear it out. So that those reference marks do help. And coloring inside of a flute, it's a simple procedure. Um, and I'm saying it because if you're wondering how she makes those slicing cuts and the little ribbons coming off, because no chunks come off, little ribbons come off, then you have to see what she's doing with that flute. Um, and I'll run into that with a lot of people to call saying, how do you make that cut? I only have a bowl gouge. That's okay. Who sharpens a gouge? You. You can sharpen a gouge through an elliptical tech grind by hand, as long as you can duplicate it. Get your tablet, your table set up and do it by hand, because you only make one pass to touch it back up again. You can use a regular bowl gouge to do that kind of slice. It's slicing wood. Yeah. Easy to make do. Anybody else up yeah. tonight? I yeah, I can. Who's, who said it? Kim, it's Roddy. Kim, Kim uh, Eddie has a, a video. I'm going to put a plug in for Eddie. Eddie's got a video with a bowl gouge, and he's using a popsicle stick. And I thought, sure, he was going to tell you that. But if you take that popsicle stick and glue it to the top of your bowl gouge and then show everybody how that popsicle stick the angle of the popsicle stick related to the bowl gouge is a good presentation. I cheated. I copied that from Cindy. I never did say that because, you know, um, but it did work. I put a little bowl, a little piece of a bowl gouge. Here's the thing. Put That's the a good gouge, idea. Put the bowl gouge on and then do your test cut because if you put it in the wrong place, you can't turn your gouge. Uh, I only I heard that I, it didn't ex, I didn't experience that. I only heard that. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, <laughs> looking for it in this kind of input, folks. Um, anybody got anything else this evening? Eddie, I just finished this up today. Oh wow! We'll, we'll go back to that. I'm trying to get you on spotlight. I get it. It had you a second ago. There we go. What's the material? It's uh. Maple, hard maple. All right. Was it dry? Yes, it was very dry. Can you have yeah. what, eight or ten spirals on it, or I mean, in, in oh yeah, lots. And the red comes off. Oh, there it goes. Got the inside finished. And it goes back on good solid sound to it yeah it's it's a good solid piece that piece sounded like china when it when it went back together well that's kind of what the you know the idea is to set this on the counter and, and people think it's it's pottery and uh, it's not it's it's wood but it it really you know really pops outstanding job really of embellishment whoa whoa say again I said outstanding uh, embellishment job. Thank you. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I did my 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 pendant video for y'all a few weeks ago, and that that the pendants are what I use to practice to be able to do this. I need to be able to predict what that tool is going to do when I put it into the wood. Now that's handy. Yep. Great work. Well, a little while ago, Johnny was talking about he made that, that first spindle out of pine. Uh, Ronnie Bonnet, he won't tell you this right off the bat. His favorite turning material comes from Lowe's 
and Home Depot for 88 cents an entire length. Yep. Uh, and, and and he's done some really nice. Haven't you, Ronnie? Haven't you done some really nice uh, work with those pieces? Yeah, and uh, Eddie Eddie won't let me down about it. Uh, from time <laughs> to time, he'll send me a picture of a flatbed truck loaded with uh, two by fours, and he and he tells me that I'm, I'm getting a load of wood at my house. Turning wood. All right, but you know, do you know that that's the, Johnny's got it. Ronnie's got it. Uh, some of the other folks may realize it. If in doubt, try it out. Um, right. I tore down the shopping center and had some three by eight mahogany rails. I wore the heck out of them because I could test them all the time. Uh, every shape I did, every every tool I got, I'd cut it on that mahogany. It was just dense enough to give me a good finish, but and but it was better than using a two by four or four by four but it gave me a nice finish nice piece to work on uh steve did you have something else sir this is pine it's just all made out of, out of, out of two by four basically there you go ronnie competition that, that, that's segmented that's a good looking two by four every week yeah, i'll do that yeah now the, the base is segment. Oh wow! Uh -uh. Turn it back up to so we can see that. And look at that, Ronnie. He's got to flip it a little bit. There's a star in that base. Um, yeah, it, the toys brought it out a second ago. Yep. Yeah. There it is. There it is. So that's a really nice piece. That's a nice. Piece. It's just just a two by four. I wanted to prove that I could do it. Uh, I'm, I've got some. I got a hold of some chestnut from a, a friend up in Illinois that knows where there's chestnut trees still growing, and when they start dying, he harvests them. And I've got a little bit of chestnut from him, and I want always wanted to make a chestnut bowl, so that's my proof that I can do it. So I'm gonna, the next project's going to be a chestnut bowl. A test piece. Good move. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And you, you, we're here so you can gather some of these ideas. He did a test bowl before he took his special wood or exotic wood or a burrow. You always want to test something before you got a burrow. Um, and he tested it to see if his uh, the segments laid out properly, if he could figure out the design and make it work, do that center. I got a piece, I got a piece right here that I did over 20 years ago, and that's a six segment base. And look at that center. Yep. I'm bragging on this one. This is 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, but I did it with exacting measurements and test pieces. Probably I, I stripped the forest of two by fours making the samples for this, but I didn't know the science of double sleds and all that. And I went at it with a single sled and one fix and a tap hammer to make adjustments. Um, it was a simple, simple project. When we get it showing you shop things with segments and laying them out and programming them in, um, that it's an easy piece, but it requires testing. And what you don't have, patience. Anybody else tonight? Hey, I'll jump you back in. Oh. Okay, hold, hold Go ahead, on. Jim. Sorry. <laughs> I, I lost my mouse went bad. Um, Jim, what you got? What you got, Kim? Local, um, I contacted a local cabinet company uh, that builds cabinets, cabinet doors and such, and they had dumpster fulls of very good they call it scrap, but perfect for segmenting. Um, yeah. So I asked the owner and he said, I'm more than welcome to uh, dumpster dive anytime I want to. <laughs> and so believe it or not, a lot of my maple pieces um, that I've been kind of playing around with segments uh, is from the dumpster, from the cabinet company. And I've gotten cypress, I've gotten walnut, I've gotten maple. And if you, 
leave like a barrel or a basket or something with them, a lot of those guys would be more than happy to throw their scrap uh, pieces in there. And I've gotten pieces that I wouldn't consider scrap. I mean, I could rebuild, you know, t my cabinets with the amount of wood I've gotten out of their dumpster. So that's, I try to encourage people call up your local cabinet company. They might be more than, you know, willing to get rid of what they call scraps, which is perfect for us segmenters. Just to put that in there, give you an idea. I do that, and then I screwed up and mentioned what I was doing at a club meeting. Uh huh. That guy got off two hours early, and I did. So he had two hours of dumpster driving before I could get there. Uh, but I, 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 <laughs> yeah. this company was doing work in a high rise downtown, and they had tons of exotics, and it was really done nice. And I'd get a, a piece. Of this this vase here was done out of a rip from. And these are staves. This, these are staves with some different uh, segments or, or across. Staves are vertical. And I did this, and I'm trying to find a router bit from, I believe, Rockler. And that's why I got to find to see whose package it came in. But you cut them as a stave, and you put them together. And because they used that router bit uh, to get the wall, the, the lines right, this thing, 20, I just said a minute ago, 20 years old. Um, less than a quarter, sometimes at the top, less than an eighth, um, not a crack in it. My wife's had it in her studio for 20 years, and uh, it's wow. held sewing, scissors, because the bottom's a little gooed up, um, and all that. But it was how I laid it out, and the wood was seasoned to make furniture. And I found another shop, and I called, Kim, I called them and asked them, and the guy said, no, we can't do that. So then I went by and walked in the back door and the guy said, bring your trailer. He said, no, the front counter ones, yeah. but bring your trailer. And I started that yeah. and then I developed a relationship with the guy that did Corian. He used to be one of my apprentices a long time ago. Uh, he had a Corian shop. I would visit him about once a month or every other month and I'd park my full body trailer right there, and it would be squatting on the tires when I went to pick it up. And I'd bring it to club meetings and let people have a hand, you know, we'd put it in a raffle or the auction, or just give it away. Uh, and it would be an inch, inch and eighth wide, half inch thick, but maybe a 10 foot rip of it. That one 10 foot rip would be two or three rings in a bowl, but you better learn how to put a Corian together if you do that. Thank you, Kim. That was a great idea. Anybody else up to see yeah. me? You're talking about cabinet scraps. I am. Oh, let's see if I can flip these around. Um, so I got an old drawer front and a door and piece of trim that I used to do cabinetry, and I still have buddies that install cabinetry. So they bring me by stuff, and the door fronts in the are three quarters thick. I usually cut them up into pin blanks. Yep. And I've been making pins with them, <laughs> it's, it's and almost, a bunch of other stuff. But <laughs> it's almost that like, piece of walnut's beautiful. <laughs> it is it's got great grain to it. Oh yeah, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with that yet. Okay, you put it in a box and you mail it to. <laughs> Doug Rowe. You mail it to Doug Rowe. <laughs> and then uh, I got a buddy of mine that does works for a tree service, and he brought me these last week. He said they were oak. So I got, oh, that guy and that guy. I'm not sure if it's oak. Somebody on Facebook said it was ash. So I turned a little, oh, out of a, just a little chunk of it. But I don't, I have no clue what it is. <laughs> I, sure. I go with the ash uh, uh, answer. Ash? Yeah. Okay. The grain the grain looks a little bit more dispersed and looks like hot weather, cold weather um, growth. So uh, I would kind of go with that. Um, okay. Well, and, you know, I've been playing around with it. I got another one I think I posted on Facebook, a bull I had turned, and that was the – First time I've used a bull gouge, I finally broke down and got a couple of them. And uh, now I see, you know, kind of trying to figure out the whole riding the bevel thing. And man, it's actually pretty cool. 
makes a mess, but <laughs> a lot well, of fun. It's a mess of little, literally shavings instead of chunks. Oh yeah, that makes <laughs> so, I've cleaned up some. <laughs> but, See that Ronnie, dirty floor. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Oh, there we go. But yeah, I'm having fun with it. Uh, trying to figure out how to go about drying this bowl and shavings and weight or. <laughs> um, if I do a bowl that's slightly damp or wet or green, um, I would normally do the turning on it and get it all the way to where I want to finish it at. And then I would pack it in a brown paper bag with the shavings from what came off of it because I do know if you cross shavings you cross in bacteria uh, yeah awesome sp spalting but you could get some awesome ugly um, and then I just put it on the shelf and let it sit there for about six months we don't have that kind of patience but that's <laughs> what I've done I've turned I've turned black gum so thin you'd think it was pup tupper uh, tupper made or pup or whatever that stuff that, that you know, people <laughs> Tupperware. Uh, Tupperware. Yeah. Uh, that thin out of black gum and put it in that bag for a couple of weeks and took it out and put it in a bag of kitty litter to finish it off. Unscented kitty litter. <laughs> and, and, and Unused too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Those little black marks can give you some this thing. <laughs> uh, but that, Kim, do you have anything on that kind of material? Uh oh, she's shaking her head. On what? I'm sorry. On drying wood, you turn it. You're turning it. You're turning yeah. it wet. And you want to turn it, and you want here, to dry any tips. Here in here in Florida, it's too humid to do shavings. I will literally get mold brick. Um, I haven't been able to wrap it in plastic. That just mold literally grows overnight here. I have tried using crystal kitty litter. Um, you can get a three pound bag of it. At, and I've been experimenting with it with some pieces and um, I would weigh it. You weigh, you weigh it drying like that. And I've had it to where it dropped over 150 grams in less than 24 hours out of a piece of mahogany I was doing uh, of moisture. So that's, that's pretty decent. And the kitty litter is pretty easy to dry back out again. You can just lay it on a pan and put it in the sun. Um, and then you can, of course, you just weigh it to make sure that some, it lost some moisture. Uh, I've used my kitty litter without drying it back out again um, four times on some, you know, medium sized eight inch bowls. Uh, I just put a ton in the bowl and then let it sit in the bag, in a plastic bag. And um, it's, it, it absorbs the moisture out of the bowls pretty quickly and I don't get mold. So that's a bonus. <laughs> so yeah, crystal it, kitty litter, it, you can get it on Amazon too. Somebody popped in. Are you broke up? Okay. Um. I found the plastic bag, just like you did, the plastic bag. I'm in New Orleans. The plastic bag is just like an invitation to mold. And, and sometimes mold can be ugly. That's why I said brown paper bag. Um, and that's not easy to find. But we go to whole <laughs> Nobody really has those anymore. Go buy something at Cracker Barrel. Yeah, well, that's whole food companies yeah. like Cracker Barrel. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they, they're they're saving the planet, so using paper bags. So Eddie, Eddie, <clears throat> Eddie, yeah. Here, get hey. you, what? How? How do you determine when when it's dry enough to return? Once once you have it in the bag, I've I've done it, and I've I weighed the uh, I've weighed the uh, bowls or blanks. Uh, they've reduced uh, like seventy some percent of their uh, original weight, but I don't know when I'm, uh, they'd be dry enough to, uh, to, to turn. When it's so, okay, we have 46 people, let's get 46 opinions. Uh, okay. <laughs> stops losing weight, you know it's dry. Yeah. Yeah, when it stops losing weight, 
that's what I would say. What Just stop losing when weight? it stops dropping. Yeah, it, and that that means you weigh it every five days, right? A month, you know, a couple months, and when it stops losing weight, it just kind of stays. And it's, you know, it's acclimating to the current humidity and everything else outside. The thing I do is uh, my shop has, it's built with two by fours of kit that are kiln dry. And I take a moisture meter and moisture meter what the wood in my shop that's made of, what it meters at. And then I compare it with the wood that I'm trying to dry. And if I can get within about five, you know, points or five percent. Uh, then I know it's it's going to be pretty decent because um, my wood in my shop stays around nine to twelve percent, and that's a kiln dried piece of lumber. So getting an idea of what your um, the moisture in your in your shop or in your you know current humidity is right. gives you more of an idea if you're metering it. If you're going to dry it and just weigh it, then you just weigh it, and once it starts slowing down, losing its weight or it kind of like stays at the same weight yeah i have i haven't bought a, pro, uh, a moisture meter yet so I'm, I'm just going by percentage of weight loss yeah um yeah you could get a cheap one at harbor freight yeah but you don't really need a moisture meter if you just start weighing it you'll you'll notice when it stops losing weight i've got a dryer yeah. I built a dryer so that I can I can get a wet piece of wood, turn turn it rough, put it in the dryer, and it, within three or four weeks it's ready to finish turn. But it's just a uh, an old upright freezer that doesn't work, so it was free. So I haul, all I do is haul it home, and I put a little uh, light bulb base in the bottom of it. And instead of a light bulb, I got a 60 watt snake heater that I put in there. And I can keep that uh, inside of that freezer at about 124 degrees. And Do you have uh, airflow going through it? Yeah, there's a little bit of airflow. Uh, I've got holes in the top so that I can get the air moving out so that there's airflow moving. Oh, it's not, uh, you don't have a fan? Yeah, well, there's a fan. There's also a, a, a small uh, dehumidifier in the bottom along with the heater. So it's got a fan in it, and it's blowing the air and circulating it. Okay. Good tip. All right. Thank you. Well, one, maybe Doug could tell me, too, because he's out in Arizona, because I definitely don't have a humidity problem here. <laughs> So I'm in Colorado, so. <laughs> no, I think you have the buy humidity, don't you? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, what if, I mean, you know, everybody's talking about drying it. Uh, my little shop, it's, a, I don't know, maybe an eight by eight shed. And it gets pretty warm during the day. I wonder if I don't just leave it sitting in there. Or will it crack? Oh, that, that works in the summertime. Yeah, it's not going to work for you in the winter. No, uh, you can you can make, that I've been make a dryer it. out of a out of a out of an old cooler, as long as it'll close up. Yeah, Put a small light bulb in the bottom of it for heat. So um, here's here's a little trick I've been doing. So. Um, this is another little piece of walnut I just turned. So my wife already stole it, hence the flowers. It's round on this side, it, it's flat yes, on that side. Is. And uh, so with the wet walnut, and I, just, I have a ton of it, what I've been doing is I'll, I'll turn it to whatever my shape is gonna be and then hollow it on this one because the this side is just it's just barking it's flat my fat dog is walking by um, anyway <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, what the technique i've been using and i, I just kind of guessed and it, it seems to be working i'll turn it to its shape hollow it to whatever i'm hollowing it to um to my finished or just about finished and then i'll put a ca finish on the outside 
no finish at all on the inside, just CA on the outside and let it sit for a few days. And what that seems to be doing is it sucks, the, it, it forces the moisture to go out through the inside. So I've already, I filled all my cracks, sanded them down. And then I will turn it one more time and take that, that first CA finish off, then sand it down to whatever level I'm gonna sand it to. And then this one again is just lacquer, um, no shine juice or anything, because there's no way to get a friction with a, a flat side, round side. I don't know how you do that without breaking a finger. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> French but so if that helps you with, with Greenwood out west, that that's what I've been doing lately. And I've been getting a lot of good success with that. Along with that, uh, uh, I want to talk real quick about CA finish and or just using CA glue in general and gloves. Um, most of us, oh, I'm not, there we go. Um, we got the, the regular latex gloves, right? So with the, uh, the latex, if I get a little bit of CA on me, this one's about out, get a little damp. Okay, that one's gonna make a liar out of me. <laughs> hey, just a, a little drop, that latex sticks pretty quick, right? And it's just going to tear. So check this out. I found this on some YouTube channel, and I, I can't even remember where I found it. But I tried it, and I'll be danged if it doesn't work. Instead of latex, the dang food server gloves. Now, you just saw what that glue did on my latex. <laughs> it's not sticking. I don't know why. But there you go. So I've been using food handler gloves now when I'm messing with my CA glue instead of the latex gloves. You can also use your um, little bags that your pen kits come in. The little plastic bags. You know everybody has all those little plastic bags that build up everywhere. If you're applying CA finishes to something instead of a paper towel, which then absorbs so much CA glue that you end up not putting on your pen, you can use those little plastic bags that all those pen stuff come in to use it to apply to your pens or whatever you're going to do a CA finish to. That way it doesn't stick, the CA finish doesn't stick to those plastic bags, get on your hand, and you're applying all of the CA instead of wasting some. So don't, don't throw away those little bags. They have great use. I'm a, a find use for everything kind of person, and I discovered that by watching a YouTube video too. And uh, just to throw that out there while he was on that subject, in case you can't get the gloves, because gloves are like so hard to find now. Good tip. Never, I've never had that oh, oh, problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, raise your hand if you went to, out the next day with holes from the CA, you know, where you try to pull them apart. Oh. And don't lick it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so the, the, the safest thing to do is always keep the bottle of debinder right there while you're doing it. Yeah, that's that's handy. Uh, I can buy so yeah. much more CA glue, though, if I don't spend money on debinder. <laughs> <laughs> True. Right. <laughs> Bernamont is a dentist. He said you'd be surprised how many times I got a CA off of uh, dental appliances because uh, of false teeth and all, and, and it leaves a bit of you on it. Um, I just learned don't wet it. Uh, get it off with the debonder. Uh, if you think you're going to wash it off, you're going to lose a finger or a th you know it's going to eat a hole through your skin. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful yeah, material. Will react very badly. Pardon me, Kim. I said some people just react very badly to it. Um, burns, they get burns very easily. I've been fortunate enough to where I just end up gluing my fingers together, and it doesn't burn, but I, <laughs> I'm stuck like this. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's always fun. Yeah. Well, I feel bad because I've used it to seal up cuts. <laughs> uh, so have I. Great. So have I. You ever work on a construction site? That's a go-to. Those yep. rock tape. Of duct tape on it and get your butt. Electrical. My father was a mechanic. Yeah, my father Electrical was a mechanic. tape. It's got some like stretch to it. That's what CAD is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Wow, we all we all have stories that don't involve band aids. <laughs> yeah. okay. no. Anything else this evening? It's been a little oh, band aids. <laughs> yeah, no band aids. Yeah, they cost a lot of money. Um, my wife got upset me. I I cut my arm. Uh, while cutting the grass of a lemon tree or something, grabbed me and tore it, and I'm on these drugs for the blood, and it wouldn't stop bleeding. And I said, give me some duct tape and a piece of paper towel. That wasn't happening. We had to go visit the emergency room. Um, but in my de construction days, a paper towel and duct tape would have been great. Would have been great. Um, and a rubber band. You got to have a rubber band, too. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. This evening? All right, with that, it's almost 9.30 Central Daylight Time. We've had a fun time this evening. We shared a lot, a lot of information, a lot of stories. And you know what? And you do know this. It's all for you. So if you've got a story, you've got a tip, you got a hint, you have a technique, you have an idea, you have a question or a problem, this is where you come. And, and J Jason said, I had to learn how to use that bowl cut the bowl gouge to get it in there. You know, if you're really good with the bowl gouge, not you, Jason. If somebody else is really good with the bowl gouge and can give us a quick demonstration, we'll come we'll come right there, right now. Come to your shop. Right now. All you need is that camera that you have. Or that iPad or the computer or that iPhone or whatever. We'll see you. We can put it up from your video right to here and show people, share people. Share the ideas. So with that, I'm going to call it a night, and I hope to see all of y'all back here again next Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time for the BS section and 7 o'clock for the program. Until next time, please be good and, above all else, be safe. Thank you. Thank good you, night. Eddie. Great yeah. job. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate what you do. Hi. Good night, everyone. Night, Ronnie. 54 people Everybody. on the video tonight, Eddie. 54 people? 64. Wow. 64. 64. Good night. That was the that was the high that I saw. Good. Good night, everyone. Good night. We didn't talk much with Dane tonight. I gotta Dan, are you still about? Okay. Well, Dane, we'll pop in with you next week and get a, get some info, huh? All right. Yep, that sounds good. I couldn't get a word in. <laughs> we lost your mic, Dane. Good night, now. Good night, Eddie. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank, thank you all. Good night. Good night. Eddie, hello. Has Martin fallen asleep in his chair? Mind, it is three o'clock in the UK. It's actually quarter past three, Martin. I know it is. <laughs> Poor old Martin's fallen asleep in his chair there. Yeah, hold it down. You're going to wake up, Martin. He'll, he'll, he'll wake up. He'll be fine. <laughs> if, if not, his wife will find him in the morning, Eddie. It'll be all right. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you next week, Eddie. Next week, gentlemen. Ladies, wood turners. <laughs> Good night, Chris. All right, Martin. See you later, mate. See you later, Eddie. All righty. Martin, we wrapping it up, bud. I'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>